All right, well, I'm gonna get uh, this started off again today. Again, thanks everyone for coming to day three of the uh, Snowbird Networks Training Initiative, Module 5 uh, about genetics. So I'm here with uh, uh, Dr. Anya Nenska, Imaging Counselor and Charlotte Hacker, Byron Weckworth, so it's good to have you back um, today. So uh, day three, we're gonna get into um, a bit more of like, all right, We've gone through those these initial steps of introducing you to the concepts and the concepts, and then last uh, week was you know like what we've been saying really important is understanding sampling design, the importance of really good sampling and lab etiquette. So where we left off last week is all right. We've done our DNA extractions. We have our DNA that we hope is a snow up, but we're not sure yet. Where are our next steps, and what do we do now uh, based upon you know particular goals of the project? So today I'll, I'll get us start us off with just kind of those initial next steps where we're getting uh, the species ID, um, we can do the, the individual identification of those and, and with those the sex identification. Um, so sort of pulling us through that process and then just saying, okay, these are now your potential um, analytical options once you have your, your foundational database. And then uh, both Charlotte and Imogene are gonna then take you kind of into down the road of some of those possible analytical uh, methods uh, with um, uh, Charlotte talking about uh, using molecular approaches to analyze and diet and imaging uh, getting into some of the ecological landscape modeling concepts that you can you can look at. So those two, uh, imaging and Charlotte will be, will be exciting, interesting, uh, lots of cool pictures. Mine is going to be a bit drier, um, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to jazz it up. The, um, so again, we're sort of just review where we're starting from here. Um, we got our raw samples from the field, raw sample being literal scat, and we've now extracted DNA from that. So the raw field sample would be the scat, the raw lab sample is essentially this DNA of unknown origin. So we've gone through the DNA extraction optimization step. Bear in mind that what I'm gonna be talking about in the next you know, 15, 20 minutes is really with the emphasis on getting the host of that um, of that of that fecal DNA sample, whereas uh, Charlotte will probably talk a bit of it more about how, well, maybe what if we don't want the host, but want more what's what's been eaten in that scat. So there'll be a slightly different angle on how you might do some of these steps. But uh, again, what I'm covering here is is really where we've emphasized getting where who who left that that scat and 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 then all the, the different types of questions we can answer from that. Um, so really, but the first thing we have to do is, is figure out, okay, is this actually from our target species? In this case, is it from a snow leopard? So we will do a species ID, and from that alone, you could, you could get into occupancy. If you have enough samples replicated across uh, your sampling landscape, you could start you know, doing some, some analysis of occupancy of your species. Um, once we get to the next, Stage after that would be individual ideas now, all right, among all these snow leopards that we had, uh, how many actual individuals rep are represented within those samples? Um, that unlocks a whole nother set of, of, of data to answer a whole host of other questions. It's really the foundation of all of our downstream analysis. And, and I put sex ID into parentheses there because that is really, you would do that after you have your number of individuals sorted out if you want to get at six ratios and all that. So I'll cover that briefly because it is, it can be important based upon what your questions are, but it sort of ties in pretty closely to the individual ID step in, in most cases. And then from those, once you have those individual IDs set out in that data set, um, there's a whole host of things you can do. I think one of the most important that, um, that, that we've been talking about on and on is, is getting estimates of abundance, just counting the number of cats out there, understanding the population sizes, um, but then also getting into population dynamics that include things like connectivity and, and various demographic parameters. Um, and then uh, things like landscape genetics, how the landscape is impacting those population dynamics. So uh, because this is pretty, this can be pretty dry topic, I thought I'd bring in a bit of a real world example of where um, you want to do species ideas. Often where you have a novel uh, habitat that you want to go in and, and examine, um, sort of exploratory of, well, it's still up, it's here. Um, and so a great case of that, the most recent thing I was involved with was going to uh, Northern Myanmar and looking to see if there were snow leopards uh, 
and the Kakabratsi National Park. So this is my this is my chance to plug some cool photos um, to compete with Imogen and, and Charlotte. So just real quickly, in case you're not familiar, me and Mar, if, if you do, um, you know, you take your average snow leopard habitat analysis, you'll see that the office predicted snow leopard habitat exists in the northern part of Myanmar. But no one's ever, Myanmar is not considered a range state. It's not one of the 12 range states, but there is this little nugget of uh, snow leopard, potential snow leopard habitat, but no one's ever actually gone to check it out because it's, it takes about two weeks of bushwhacking through that jungle to get there. Um, at that, in that same area is, is, a, is a designated national park called Kakabaratsi. It's named after the, uh, there's a mountain peak there. It's the tallest mountain of Southeast Asia. And so uh, we identified uh, through some of the mapping exercises and talking with some rangers what we thought would be the best uh, potential snow leopard habitat in the region based upon really where they've seen some blue sheep um, in the past, but really limited efforts even by the, the park staff to survey the area. So with a bit of that background information, we were given the funding to go and, and had the privilege of leading an expedition there. Uh, 2017. So uh, with that, of course, we went and put up tons of camera traps because it's not real snow leopard work unless you do camera traps. But of course, we also collected uh, our non-invasive samples of DNA. So as we scoured the landscape uh, looking for sign, we came across 19 scats that we were able to collect and then bring those into the lab. So you could think of your, your own selves, your own projects, going out, new, a new uh, place that hasn't been surveyed before, doing your surveys, collecting your scats, and you're bringing it to the lab. And that's what we're picking up on, on today. So you might come in with the data, your data sets. Um, for us, we used, um, you know, we'd have a sample ID in our tubes. Uh, very important, as, as Charlotte was describing and imaging last week. Um, we also recorded the site based upon GPS location, the who was collecting it, when it was collected, number of tubes, a whole, whole host of information, um, some of which uh, Charlotte described based upon our needs and what we wanted to answer with, with some, of the, some of the questions on, on better understanding where these samples are coming from and describing them later in downstream analyses. Uh, so all this information is conveyed to the lab where we then initiate our species identification protocol. So species ID. I know that uh, we covered a little bit briefly earlier. I think Imogene mentioned some things, but just to review real quickly, it's essentially, a, maybe you've heard of DNA, DNA barcoding. So it's where these very short gene regions are used to identify species. And there's actually global initiatives to have standardized sets of protocols and, and approaches to, you know, DNA barcoding methodology to describe the world's biodiversity. Uh, and so we're really just borrowing a page out of, out of those approaches um, and focusing it in on, on our non-invasive collections um, and, and our species of interest. So, so the key to good DNA barcoding sequencing is that there's enough variability within your sequence to distinguish between species, but also it's typically gonna be short in length for a couple of reasons. One is you wanna be able to do it, uh, amplify it quickly in the lab with one reaction, so just one PCR run um, and you have um, the sequence of, of interest that's going to work. But also, remember that with fecal DNA, it's a low quality, low quantity template. And that low quality typically means that the expectation to get long uh, reads of, of DNA is, is going to be challenging because it's already degraded. The, the DNA is a bit chopped up and, and difficult to get reliably long reads. Excuse me, long reads. Um, so, so when we design these barcoding sequences, um, they're typically short in the number of base pairs in length. And by short, I mean, you know, a couple hundred perhaps. Um, also important is that, um, that they're in reserve, conserved regions of, of the genome where you're designing this primer so that they're going to work across the different species and not just these species, two species specific. Again, that specificity can, can vary based upon um, um, the types of genes you're using and what your goals are for your project. Uh, so typically uh, we're using with mammals uh, the mitochondrial DNA. Um, of course you can use mitochondrial DNA for other taxon as well. Uh, the um, primers are, are based upon any number of these different genes you can see in the, in the 
in the graph here. Um, and then different, you can design your primers, you can have different levels of discriminating power. Um, and there's some level of specificity. So you could have specific gene regions that are specific to distinguishing among carnivores and eliminating other things, or it could be all just mammals, it could be all vertebrates. So develop, depending upon what your needs are for your question, uh, you can have a set of, of primers that distinguish among um, a different sort of hierarchy of, of taxonomy. Um, our, my, my approach to philosophy, the, the groups I've worked with and the labs I've worked in is to do multiple um, markers. So for these Myanmar samples, we use a cytochrome B uh, uh, marker, we use the 12S and the 16S. And then we do that, we, for each sample, we do that for all three of those markers and we're looking for congruence across them. So um, essentially how that is, we do a PCR with, our, with a set of primers um, and then we use some sort of sequencing editing program to then look at those and edit those. Um, we'll check and edit them for quality control. We'll do a re reverse complement. You know, we have our five to three prime, our forward strand and our backward strand to essentially check one another then save that in a, in a FASTA format. So I thought just, just so you can kind of understand what that actually looks like, I have a couple sequences I can pull out and show you. First, we'll look at a, a nice one. Um, so you've never done this before, you might be wondering what. So this is an electropharogram. Let's talk about these a little bit more. So essentially, each of these peaks is being um, read by the sequencing machine that we're using. There's, a whole, there's several different uh, brands of machines that might be used to, to get this data. This is probably, I think, from an ABI sequencer. I'm not sure which model, but what we're reading, as you see across the screen, is all the different nucleotides. So T's or the thymine, G's, guamine, adenine, cytosine. And this is a raw read, and this is a really nice one um, from a fecal sample. So you can see where individual peaks are very clearly distinguishable. So that equates down to our, our actual um, text sequence read down here. So this is the actual data, the sequence in the bottom here. And if you look across um, up here where it's calling it on the electropharogram, A, T, A, 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 so you can see it down here, A, T, A, A, A. So when we're talking about trimming these sequences as we're getting rid of this low quality sequence, right? Between here, it's really hard to, to, to understand if this is uh, it's real or it's primer dimer or some sort of, you know, it, uh, the, the DNA polymerase isn't working efficiently at the very beginning and ends or reads. So we trim those off and we leave ourselves only the high quality read. And so what that might, and then we would do that with the reverse complement. And then what that looks like is um, you get your consensus sequence, which is gonna be this nice clean read of our, the, the data that we're, that we're confident in. And we save that, this is a, a FASTA format. Now, in contrast to that, a bad sequence might look like this. If you're just looking at the text, you wouldn't know, but that's why we compare it to electropharogram and do the quality control by eye. So this is pretty messy. We could change our, our y-axis to say, all right, what, what does this actually look like? And see clearly uh, nothing reliably distinguishable across this sequence. It's really dirty, probably poor quality DNA. Um, you know, there are other, aspects of your PCR process that can lead to really messy sequencing. But this is, this is I think it's just a pretty classic case of just bad template. There's just, there's nothing, the DNA polymerase is working efficiently because it's not a good template to work on. Um, so this would be one that we'd completely throw out. There's nothing salvageable here, of course. And there's everything in between. The first one I showed you was pristine, perfect, ideal. And this is like completely unusable. Unfortunately, it's not one or the other. You, the most cases it's something in between where you have to spend a lot of time going across and trying to, to sort out by eye um, what are reliable reads and which ones are unreliable, in which case you put, you know, you put an N in for like just unknown on a particular site. But you do that for all your sequences and you end up with a, with, um, a file of all your consensus sequences that might look like this. So maybe out of all my sequences, I ended up with 
with seven that I was confident in, in using those for my next stage of species ID. So this would be the set of consensus sequences that, that are aligned um, and ready for, for species identification. So that takes us to the next step of how do you do the species? So there's a number of, there's two different things I'll describe. The one that's probably the most universally used and the easiest uh, is to do what's called a BLAST search. So BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. It's, it's, it's just a fun way of saying, searching a database for things that are like the sequence that you have. And uh, um, there are, I'm not gonna go through this in depth. We'll, I'll run us through it just so you can see how it works, but there are a number of tutorials and guides um, available online. I've listed a couple here that get into the nitty gritty of how it all works. Um, but just to, just to demonstrate it real quick for you, we can go to the, the website. So this particular blast search is, as far as I know, is the, probably the most used um, globally. It's at, based at the National Institute of Health's um, National Center for Biotechnology Information. Um, <clears throat> you click the link, you go to the BLAST search at, at NCBI, and the first page you go to is here. So there's a number of different ways you can uh, search and different types of, of, of sequencing reads that you, can, that you can look for based upon the pure nucleotides, those translate into amino acids, those amino acids translate into proteins. What we're worried about here is purely just our nucleotides, um, our sequences based upon those A's, C's, G's, and T's. So we're gonna do a nucleotide blast. And this is what the, the primary search page looks like. It's like a lot of search engines on you know, Google Scholar or Web of Science, things like that. There's different ways you can search and query a database, of course. Again, I'm not gonna go into all the details on these different options and how, how it works. Some of those tutorials would, can, can walk you through all the details. But suffice to say, um, our database that we want to look through is going to be the one based on the nucleotide collection. Um, we could specify, uh, you know, just panthera, just uh, 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 mammals, or, or whatever. I'm going to leave that as it is. And then there's a number of, uh, and leave this, uh, this this program optimizing at just the, the broadest possible. Um, so really, just this, just just all the the standard presets, we'll just leave as they are. So there's two different ways that you can enter in your sequences. You can manually go and uh, pull up a sequence. You can copy that. And um, paste. There's our sequence in, this, in the sequence window. That's our this is the individual name. And just hit blast. Let's see, see what was that species. Takes a couple seconds to do the search. Seven seconds. Oh, second, 10 seconds. Uh oh. I think we broke the internet. It should take about two seconds. I'm not sure what just happened here. There we go. All right. So next comes our results page. So we've queried the database. So this database comes from. Uh, Published studies are often required. If you ever published work using genetics, you're required to, to import your sequence data onto a, a public uh, database like this. So someone can always look up your work and try to replicate it if they, if they wanted to or use it to add to their own work. Um, so there's literally millions of sequences on um, the GenBank um, database here. And so this one comes up as Suez Schaefer uh, and, and Pseudo Star. We see these in this description of, of what it's matching. You'll see a whole series of numbers on the right here. Again, I'm not going to explain all these different values. These are essentially your scores, your matching scores, like how well um, are, is what you had, your unknown sequence, matching to the different parts of the database. Uh, we can see that we're getting a nine. So one thing to focus on in this case is just the percent identity. So this is how much of the sequence that I submitted matches the sequences that it found. And so we see 99.52% match to, to this and 99.28% um, to Suez Nayar. Uh, if, and if you don't know, I think most of you probably do, this is, these are blue sheep, right? 
So it seems like in that sample, what did we do? We, we unfortunately probably amplified um, the, the prey, the diet species versus the, the individual um, who left the scat because it seems unlikely that someone collected a, a blue sheep pelt thinking it was a, a carnivore snow leopard pelt. So in that case, uh, uh, we could say, all right, our DNA extraction was faulty. We ended up extracting the wrong DNA. We, amp we amplified the wrong DNA in our PCR reaction. We might go back to that sample and do another new extraction um, to try to uh, optimize that for something different. Right. Another way you can do this, if you don't want to copy and paste individually, is you can you can actually just select your um, your FASTA file of all your sequences, import that, and then do the blast. And it will do a blast search in all the sequences in that file. So if you have hundreds of sequences, this search could take uh, you know could take I guess depending on your internet connection could take you know hours. Uh, hopefully this isn't going to take too long based upon it took a while for a single sequence. If it goes too long, we'll just quit. You get the idea. Well, this is searching. Any any quick questions on this? Uh, something uh, about the blast search? All right. So again, we have our 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 results. To, to cycle through the different sequences. So this is the sequence number one. Uh, again, that's there's that uh, blue sheep. We go to the next sequence that was in our list, and that is oh, another blue sheep. So we're not, this would indicate we're not doing a very good job with our uh, DNA extractions. We're getting too much of the, of the prey DNA. Uh, in this case, oh, we got a, a Cotono. Anybody, you guys might know what that is. It's a pica. Species. Um, here, oh, we got a fox. So at least we got the carnivore. So we're getting good host DNA in this case, um, but not a snow leopard. We got a wolf or a dog. Again, see Canis lupus, familiaris, percent identity match, so 100%. So the sequence we submitted was completely similar in every way. To, um, a, to a similar sequence in the database. Uh, let's see if we got any, another fox and there we go, a snow leopard. So out of seven sequences, we had one snow leopard. Not probably the results we were hoping for. Uh, some, of those, uh, some of those blue sheep sequences would be ones we might go back to and re-extract. Um, I should also mention that this, these, these sequences are from Myanmar, um, unfortunately. I'll go back to the presentation. These are the results from the, the, the Myanmar. Um, so again, we extracted uh, all the DNA from these are the samples, the field, identifiers. The lab uh, often will create its own uh, uh, label for this is each of the samples. And then here are the three different uh, DNA markers we use, uh, mitochondrial DNA, species ID markers. And you can see for this sample, we had congruence across all three. For fox, uh, Catapuma temenkii is the, uh, the Asian golden cat. So we had several of those, more foxes. Several that failed. Um, in this case, uh, here, oops, we see it failed for two, and one of them we got. This is a wild boar. Uh, so, so we just two out of you know we're looking for two out of three really to to have congruence. But in this case, with uh, with the Snowbird expedition in in Myanmar, our non-invasive DNA failed to detect any snow leopards. So. Sad, but we also, because we use more general um, primers, we were able to describe some of the biodiversity area. Uh, this is actually the first time foxes, were, red fox were ever recorded in Myanmar and the highest elevation detection of the Asian golden cat. So still some value to this data, even if we were looking and hoping for snow leopards.
Now, real quickly, because I'm going a bit long here, um, the second way you could do uh, a species ID is by building phylogenies with reference sequences. So a phylogeny is essentially, you know, a tree of life, the family tree, it's essentially where you're creating through, through your sequence diversity, identifying differences of species across different branches. So uh, in this way, we, we might um, explain relatedness among our unknown samples by using reference samples that are, are known. So I might have a reference snow leopard, a reference wolf, a red fox, a Tibetan fox, whatever so the car carnivore community is, and have reference sequences that we download from the same database that we're just working on, and then our unknowns, as we, when we run our phylogenetic analysis, are going to fall into a clade with one of those reference sequences. And then you're identifying the unknown based upon which clade is it falling into. Uh, because it's at the species level type of analysis, you could, you know, you maybe for the neighbor joining maximum likelihood Bayesian trees, all these different ways to create a phylogeny and analyze that. Any of those are going to work because we're working at this really coarse scale um, of, de of delineating species differences. I, you know, I don't see this method used a lot. It'd be quick and dirty. It'd be something you might do if you have really poor internet and doing a database search on the web. Um, it, it just isn't working. It might crash too much. So this would be maybe an alternative way um, that you could do that and get and get reliable um, results on your NMs. So. Uh, I'm just going to touch on sex identification real quick because it's again it's 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 going to be a step you probably do after individual ID. There's no point in doing sex ID before you know how many individuals you have. It's, it wouldn't be that efficient a use of time and funds. But um, there's a couple of ways you can go about doing that. Obviously, um, we have two different sex chromosomes in X and Y, males that have heterogenic sex and, and mammals. So we can use a sequencing approach where we're sequencing. Um, uh, sex chromosome specific um, markers. So a, a Y chromosome specific marker versus an X chromosome specific marker. And we can run those PCR products out on an agarose gel. If we get two bands, um, that means that sample came from a male. If we get one band, it came from a female. Um, you, we can also use sex specific microsatellites where you get a microsatellite result very similar to, to the individual ID microsatellites. And often those are inserted within within that sort of process that you're doing in the lab anyways, um, to get at similarly, you're gonna get two different alleles if it's a male, one um, allele if it's female. But there are, some, there are some risks, especially doing this work with non-invasive samples where we have this low quality um, allelic dropout of, of a Y chromosome marker, uh, or even the X in a male would make you mislabel it as a female. There's also, as we saw, sometimes we accidentally extract and amplify the DNA of the prey species. So we may actually be getting the sex of the prey species that was eaten, not the actual host. And so, um, you, so doing sex ID it, it should be done with, it, with sort of a grain of salt and, and some understanding of, of your data. If you have a really poor quality sample, you might not put that much weight in the results of your sex ID process versus a high quality sample, you might be more confident. But as with everything uh, that we do, we often do it in replicates. We're looking for consistency across independent runs. So that takes me to, to the last step or uh, individual identification. So this is, we're mostly talking about microsatellites and doing it with this. That's the classic uh, approach to doing individual ID. Um, SNPs is another way that you can get individual identification. I'm not going to go into that. I think Jan might talk a little bit about that uh, next week when he goes over next generation sequencing methods and where we're going. Um, right now, that technology isn't available to do with non-invasive samples. Um, it's being developed, lots of different groups working on it, but, but it's not available yet. But it is, and it should be hopefully soon, another route of doing individual ID. But for, for today, we'll focus on microsatellites and as you might recall from some of the past um, talks, those are essentially looking at electropharograms like these and identifying the alleles for different, for different microsatellite loci. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more. So the number of loci we use equates to our statistical power of discriminating among individuals. And the more statistical power you have, the more loci you have among individuals, the, the greater 
um, discriminating power you have to do all sorts of your downstream analyses from, from population differentiation, pedigrees, all those things are reliant upon having enough variability within your loci, within one individual to the next in order to differentiate them and describe patterns of genetic diversity in meaningful ways. One way that we approach um, this with uh, microsatellites in the lab to make it more efficient versus you know, maybe want to do 30 something markers that I think uh, Charlotte's been working with. To do 30 different PCR reactions um, for each individual would take forever. It's just, it's, it's the non-starter. So what we do employ is what's called multiplexing. So that's with different fluorescent labels on our primers, we can run within one PCR reaction, multiple different microsatellite loci at the same time. We wanna make sure those loci don't overlap in sizes. Um, and, and so that as we pick among our fluorescent labels, we can, we can um, actually have some pictures. Here we go. So going back to this electropharogram. So the blue and the green are two different fluorescent labeled loci um, classes. And then within each of those labels, we have two different size classes. So with, on the screen right here, we're actually representing the genotype of an individual across four different microsatellite loci. And we can do this all in one PCR. So that really improves the efficiency of the lab work and, and brings down the cost as well. So we're not just uh, burning through PCR reagents to do these in four different reactions versus just all in one. I've done it, I started doing lab work long enough ago where it was before multiplexing and I can affirm to all of you that the multiplexing is a life changer for how much time and effort you put in the lab. So um, yeah, so it's pretty, if you're not multiplexing, you, you should be. So um, we do that, we do this, this across all of our low side of interest, um, minimally, you know, minimal sort of ballpark target is 12 to 15 low side. If those low side have enough variability, enough different alleles of these different size sizes to describe and provide that sort of basic, uh, that baseline level of, of genetic diversity for downstream analyses, remember our statistical power. Um, you can do much more than that as you increase the number of low side, you increase your, your power to a certain point. But then uh, there's still a level of quality control that needs to be done after we've done all of that. So we're, as I mentioned before, we're doing lots of multiple replications of, for each loci, for each individual. And those are gonna be independent PCR runs. And then we're gonna check, to see that our results are consistent across those. And I think minimally you do three PCRs per, per individual per locus. And you're gonna want those two to three to be congruent. If, or often if you're only two to three, you might do a fourth. And you're looking for, again, um, congruence across those. And if, if you can't get that, then you need to throw that locus out for the individual. We also can, once we have a final data set, run a program like MicroChecker, which uh, analyzes your data set looking for patterns that would, that would be indicative of a little dropout or non amplification of some of these common mistakes that happen um, uh, with non-invasive samples. So the bottom line here being, if you don't really enjoy lab work and you work on non-invasive samples, then you're, you're not gonna have a lot of fun. So, so the lab and the quality control are really important here. Uh, so this might be what your final data set looks like. Um, so this is across the top uh, in the yellow and the different colors are my different multiplexes and then um, uh, the rows, each row is a different individual. So these are the allele calls for, um, for this individual across all these loci. So for example, this one is a heterozygote, 197213, and then down here it's a homozygote, 19696 for that marker. And as you can see, there's, there are a number of, of individuals that just didn't get reliable results across some of the loci. And for some of these, like for example, this one here, more didn't work than worked. And so I'd probably throw this sample out of the analysis because the, the, the amount of data it's contributing to, to anything is gonna be minimal. So finally, now we have our unique, data, unique uh, our database of, of, of unique individuals. Um, and this is really that, that spreadsheet I showed you, that is your, your foundation for everything you want to do from as simple as uh, doing abundance. So I was looking through some of the previous modules and, and um, this, this individual identification is essentially your detection of, 
of, of an individual in the landscape. The same as if you're using camera traps and analyzing you know, individuals based upon spot patterns, coat patterns, um, and that being your detection. The, your, your, your detection of an individual with these microsatellites is the same thing. So that is your raw data for doing uh, abundance tests. Um, again, this is uh, the variability across all the low site is, is giving you insight into you know, population individual um, patterns of, of genetic diversity. Uh, a metric for that is often something like FST and, and doing pairwise analyses between individuals or between populations is provides the, the, the inputs for understanding gene flow and connectivity for describing populations. Um, you know, evaluating different uh, spatial scales, you know, for conservation units and, and landscape genetics. And if our power, still power is enough, we can even do things like a pedigree analysis and better understand you know, interpopulation relationships at a much smaller scale.